Good morning, good evening. Welcome to another session with a very important figure in the watch industry, Mr. Jeffrey Kingston. Jeffrey, how are you? Just fine. Uh, hello from uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, in the middle of our ski season, or I should say the tailing off of our ski season. It's getting Jeff, just Jeff's just been sharing that he's been spending the days skiing, and, and while it's uh, we bake through an Australian summer, that, that's quite a thing to hear. Now, Jeffrey, if you're not aware, Jeffrey is a real luminary in the watch industry. He's one of the uh, one of the I would say one of the few people that had a very successful career before becoming known as a speaker, a moderator, an intellectual in the industry. Jeffrey was an antitrust lawyer who was involved in some very high profile cases, one against Microsoft in Brussels. All of these things are part of Jeffrey's. Uh, I'm sure there's a Wikipedia entry there somewhere. But uh, the reason we're speaking to Jeffrey today is, you know, is not to delve into this, this life so well lived that's led to him being able to ski his days away in, uh, in America. We're talking to Jeffrey about a documentary that's surfaced, and I, I pardon the pun there, Jeffrey, but it is a, uh, a very thorough documentary on a brand that we certainly know and love at Time and Tide, and I'm sure you do too. It's Blank Pan. So Jeffrey, tell me a little bit about how this documentary came to be, and uh, you know what are we going to see today? Because I believe we're, we're fortunate enough to have uh, the entire documentary following our little clip here. So yeah, th thank you, Andrew. The, the documentary came to be really uh, based on a protest. <laughs> so I, I was asked by Blompin to write out some questions to ask Jean-Jacques Fichter, who was Blompin's CEO from about 1950 through 1980, co-CEO because he led the company together with his Aunt Betty. And I thought, why should we just write out questions for him to answer? This is a story that really needs to be told in a fulsome way. And I'd like to film him. And I'd like to add in all of the other pieces that go beyond even his own recollections. Things like what happened with the US Navy, what happened really with the French Navy, what did Bob Malubier do? And I went to Mark Hayek and I said, you know, I've written out the questions, but I don't think that's what we should do. We, this thing deserves a documentary. And Mark agreed completely. And that's what launched basically a year long project to do the film. And what interests you so much about this brand? Because I mean, I think it, it, on the fringes, it's even, even for someone who's just joining the hobby, there's an awareness that there was a, a very important provenance in dive watches. And there's an awareness of the, the sheer length of uh, continuous running of the business. But, but what is it that, that really appeals to you about Blank Pan? Honestly, it's been the people and the genuineness and authenticity of what they have done. And it probably also traces back to the fact that the first really nice watch I bought was a Blanc Pan. That kind of got it started. But I've been associated with them, I would say now for about 20 years doing various projects. A lot of them were sort of small and, and really ad hoc. This film, and if you know the magazine Lettre du Basseau have been really very deep projects. And what guided me with this film and why I got so excited about it was that there has been really a dichotomy between stories that are told about the Blanc Pan 50 Fathoms and the facts. There's a big difference. And I wanted to tell the story with the facts and not let these legends that swirl around and unfortunately sometimes are a little bit misleading. So I went to as much as I could original sources. I spent hours with Jean-Jacques Fichter talking to him. He's quite old now, he's 94, but his recollections are still sharp. And it, it's a really a pleasure to talk to him and learn firsthand really what he did, not what some internet rumor says. And I also was privileged to spend quite a bit of time with Robert Maloubier, who headed the French Combat Diving Corps and was central in their selection of a dive watch for the French Navy. And I had many meetings with him in France and Switzerland, and also, oddly enough, in Beijing at an event that we did. And I learned a lot that way. Some of it was really kind of serendipity and happenstance, because one of the important chapters of the Blanc Pai 50 Fathom story is the United States Navy's adoption of the watch. 
And that was led by Alan Tornick, who was the US distributor for Blancpain at the time in the 50s. He had passed away. And I had thought that lead of information was gone with him. Did one day a Google search just out of no particular reason to see what's there. And I found out that there was a Terry Tornick, who was the mayor of Pasadena, California, who turned out to be his son. And Terry's older brother was directly involved in the Navy process and qualification testing that selected the 50 Fathoms for the US Navy. So I learned a lot there. And then I was able to get Navy documents that had been declassified about all the testing and a few documents from uh, Jean-Jacques Fichter. So taken together, I was able to build a story from original sources and let those facts speak for themselves. The legends are out there. And rather than put the legends into the film, I thought just letting the actual facts of what happened tell their own story in a powerful way. Well, this is an industry built on uh, legends, isn't it? It's, uh, it's more about the legends and the myths than it is the facts. So I'm sure people are going to really, uh, you know, this is going to be quite a, a good experience to see a proper documentary as opposed to a promotional documentary. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, we're in for a real treat here today. Now, before we get into the movie, Jeffrey, I wonder if you can tell me the, the story of your first blank plan. How did that come about? How, how did you discover the watch? And, and tell me, how did it come to be on your wrist? It came to be on my wrist on a vacation to Hong Kong. We went with a, another couple, very, very good friends, and he was a watch collector. And it came to be that our wives wanted to go clothes shopping in Hong Kong, which inter interested us, not at all. We went out and he wanted to look at watches and I was the one who ended up buying a watch. <laughs> and I was very uh, taken with at that point, the Blancpain classic moon phase triple calendar watch. And that's the one I ended up buying. I came back from Hong Kong and started doing some research. Of what was Blancpain? I had no idea. I was not a watch guy. And then gradually got more and more interested and fell into what I'm doing now completely by accident. So that watch, Jeffrey Kingston, the man we know is, uh, you know, one of the experts in the industry. Yeah, exactly. That watch. And then it was one thing after another. There was one fortunate thing that I had going on at the time. I was flying, commuting, really, back and forth to Brussels for the Microsoft case. And it wasn't all that difficult to tack on a little stop in Switzerland, either coming or going. And that allowed me to get to know people and you meet more people and they introduce you to others and pretty soon you wake up one day and you're doing a lot in the watch world. It happened to me too, Jeffrey, so I, couldn't, I completely relate. Jeffrey, we're about to get into the movie. Uh, thank you so much for introducing this for us and thank you for offering to uh, have this published on the Time and Tide platform. We're really pleased to have such a, a quality document to show people. Thank you so very much for being part of this. My privilege. Nice talking to you, Andrew. Unforgettable That's what you are The year is 1950. Europe is in the early stages of recovery from the war. General Dwight Eisenhower is not yet even a candidate for the presidency he'll capture in 1952. In France, Charles de Gaulle is between terms as head of government. The Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe is beginning to take hold. The Berlin airlift has only recently ended. And scuba diving is in its infancy. Professionals, particularly military organizations, are coming to grips with the challenges of the underwater world. At the same time, there are a very small number of amateurs drawn to what later will be known as sport diving. One of those amateurs is a Swiss watch executive named Jean-Jacques Fichter. Together with his aunt, Betty, 
the first woman to head a Swiss watch company. He co-leads the watch house of Blancpain, then entering its third century with workshops located in the remote village of Villeray, nestled in the Swiss Jura Mountains. Fichter is an early adopter of this new sport of scuba diving. Ma tante a joué un rôle euh, important parce que elle avait. My aunt played an important role because she had a summer house in Cannes-sur-Mer on the French Riviera. That's where I had the chance to contact the scuba diving clubs that existed on the coast. Tous les clubs de plongée qui existaient déjà sur la côte à Nice. In Nice. In Cannes, in Antibes, Juan Le Pin, in Saint Tropez. Whenever I was there, I could join and take part in serious scuba diving training. You have to remember that at the beginning, there were a few scuba diving clubs, enthusiasts, so to speak, but it was not yet a popular sport. It was a different world. His fascination with the sea springs from his upbringing in Egypt and his study of history, for which he has earned a PhD. His hope is to master this new sport and make discoveries of antiquities lost underwater. During a dive off the coast of France, there's a crisis. Fichter has lost track of time and run out of air. Risking possible fatal injury, he is forced to make an emergency sprint to the surface without a decompression stop. To make a long story short, la remontée. The climb should have been slow, but I climbed much faster without taking the necessary precautions. So I ran the risk of having an attack of the bends, of having to stop my climb and not being able to come out of it. Fichter has an epiphany. He realizes that in addition to masks, fins, and air tanks, divers need a timing device to keep track of their time underwater. This underwater world demands a diving watch. But what should this diving watch consist of, and how should it be constructed? Certainly not like the men's small dress watches popular in the 40s and 50s. Half a millennium of watchmaking had given birth to well-known and established methods and designs. Indeed, there were norms followed throughout Switzerland, born from the traditions of crafting pocket watches and use of tools that guided watchmakers in the construction of a dizzying variety of watch types and the manner in which to construct them. There was no such script for a diving watch. If ever there was a white sheet of paper design, this would be it. Fichter not only had to invent the answers to questions, he had to begin by discovering what the questions would be. Water resistance was key. La plongée sous-marine, euh, c'est un, un sport extraordinaire, mais il faut leur donner. Scuba diving is an extraordinary sport, but you have to have the right equipment. Qui avait une montre étanche, généralement. Those who owned a waterproof watch usually removed it as a precaution before going into the water, because in the 50s. Water resistance was not yet guaranteed. It was the adoption of the O-ring seal that changed perceptions of the watch's water resistance. Blancpain's service center is located in the Swiss village of Le Brassu, which is located in the Valley du Joux, the legendary cradle of watchmaking. Fichter's 1950s invention of a new method to protect the O-ring seal is explained by the master watchmaker who heads Blancpain's vintage department. What was very special on the Blancpain 50 Fatum is a case bag gasket. On a normal watch, the gasket will be twisted when you screw the case back. On a Blancpain 50 Fatum, 
the gasket is sitting right on the groove then you can cover it with a back protector and when you will tie the case back that protector will not move at all that way the gasket is pressed but is not twisting on itself and it's the best way to guarantee the watch will be waterproof in a long term. Fichter's reimagining of how to adapt a watch to the underwater world led to another key innovation. The second serious problem was the crown. The crown was waterproof to a certain extent, but if you left it in position to set the time, the watch would leak. On normal watches, the gasket was on the inside of the crown. So when you use a function, the water can get inside of the watch. But on the 50th atom, the gasket is located on the tube. That way, when you use your watch, whatever the position of the crown, the water cannot get inside of the watch. Fichter's invention of the O-ring seal and crown seal would each be granted patent protection. Fichter had another inspiration, drawn from his own experience. He recognized that it would be easy for a diver to forget when a dive had started. This led him to focus upon the bezel. The importance of time becomes critical when the length of the dive increases. You have to account for the time when you increase the depth. As soon as I did my first tests in 1952, at the very beginning, I told myself that the rotating bezel had to let you calculate the time underwater. And that's what we did. The bezel is a key element of the 50 Fatum. When you go diving, it's more than important to know how much time you are spending underwater. At this time, chronographs could not be waterproof, so you could not use them. On the 50 Fatum, you have this clever bezel, which you can use. You just have to align the minute hand with the index of the bezel, and straight away you can see with your minute hands by reading on the bezel how much time you've been spending underwater. And because you want to be sure the bezel itself is not moving when you're diving, you have a very clever system to make sure you have to press the bezel to make it rotating. To manufacture the first watch cases for his watch, incorporating his inventions, Fichter was fortunate living in Villeray. Villeray was the birthplace of Blancpain, for in 1735, its founder, Jehan Jacques Blancpain, was recognized on the official village rolls as a watchmaker. This first workshop was in fact a farmhouse, cows below on the ground floor, his watchmaking upstairs. Jehan Jacques' descendants constructed additional workshops scattered throughout the village of Villeray, in one of those buildings, constructed in 1856, Betty Fichter occupied the first floor and her nephew, Jean-Jacques, the ground floor. Fichter's neighbor was a watch case maker. When I got a position at Blancpain with my aunt, I took advantage of the fact that we were right next door to the Polyfrère case manufactory in Villeray, and where Pauli, one of the directors, was interested not in scuba diving, but in making improvements. Fichter was not alone in thinking about a watch for divers. The French Navy was on the hunt for such a watch. The team commissioned to the task was led by Captain Robert Bab Maloubier and Lieutenant Claude Riffaut. Maloubier was a war hero attached to Churchill's famed Special Operations Executive, the SOE. 
he explains his quest for a watch to outfit his newly formed combat diving corps. Bah, écoutez, la première chose, c'est s'adresser à une maison euh, de montre française. The first thing was to talk to one of the French watchmaking companies, the biggest one at the time. I talked to a young, dynamic executive in a very nice office in the center of Paris. He gave me small watches that were roughly the size of a fingernail with very thick glass and nice small white bracelets. He gave us roughly 30 of them and they immediately took on water. Then we took another 30 and they immediately took on water. To such an extent that one of my non-commissioned officers called me and said, Captain, Captain, my watch isn't waterproof. I found a baby grouper in it. So we got a ruling pen, some compasses, some graph paper, and we tried to design our dream watch, the ideal watch for diving, which featured everything we wanted. Meaning, of course, luminous letters, not too many numbers, a rotating bezel, etc., etc. We drew up everything we had in mind. We proposed it to the watch company, which laughed in our face. Diving watches have no future. Through the intermediary of Spiro Technique, now Aqualung, we got in touch with Blancpain, the oldest Swiss watch brand. They, on the other hand, agreed to make our watch, and so they made it for us. It was the 50 Fathoms, the original one, which dates back to 1953. It was in service for a long time, because later on, it was selected by the SEALs, meaning the American combat divers. Also, I think, by the Pakistanis, the Spanish, etc., 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 and by the Germans. Les combat schwimmer. Malubier was decorated by Queen Elizabeth with the Order of the British Empire Medal in 2014, one year before his death at the age of 91. Malubier's ideas corresponded with Fichter's designs. Fichter had watches to supply to the French with one modification, adding protection against magnetism. As for the 50 fathoms, at the time we had specifications from the French military that we also had to take into account. In particular, they were very sensitive to the question of magnetism. And that's why they also came up with this requirement, which we added to the list. It was to guarantee that the watches were protected against magnetism. And we modified it to satisfy the requirement. But aside from that, there were no changes. With that addition of a soft iron anti-magnetic inner case, the French Combat Diving Corps had its watch. So did Fichter's diving instructor. This is the timepiece, the original 50 fathoms, the one chosen by the French Combat Diving Corps but also by Jacques-Yves Cousteau for his team of divers in their pioneering undersea adventure celebrated in the Academy Award-winning film The Silent World. Fichter needed a name for this new Blancpain. He turned to Shakespeare's Tempest for his inspiration. We talked about it amongst ourselves. And the idea came up to not use a standard watchmaking name. And that's when we went with Shakespeare. We found this musical alliteration, this play on words. It started with Full fathom five, thy father lies. You can hear the musicality of this turn of phrase, full fathom five. Full fathom five. We couldn't use full fathom, but 50 fathom preserved the alliteration. Feaster's keen insights into the needs of a diver endure today. A rotating bezel protected against inadvertent rotation 
to time the dive. Effective seals for the case back and crown. Perfect legibility with large size and white markers and hands on a black background. Luminous markings and hands for use in darkness. Automatic winding to save wear and tear on the crown seal. Shielding from magnetism. Collectors now recognize this early model from its markings Rotomatic Inca Block and Arabic numerals at 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. The design, indeed the very DNA of this 1953 example, was so spot on, so penetrating in its insights, that not only has it endured for well over half a century, but it has defined the diving watch genre for the watch world ever since. Three years after the 50 Fathoms debuted on the market, Fichter broadened his vision. The 50 Fathoms was a large watch, conceived for maximum utility while underwater. But what about women divers for whom the regular 50 Fathoms was too large? What about amateurs who wanted a timepiece that could be worn as an everyday watch and also used for diving? The answer was a smaller diameter diving watch, which he named the Bathyscaphe. He had in mind the diving vessel of a fellow Swiss, Auguste Picard. La montre 50 Fathom était une montre d'un diamètre the 50 Fathoms was a watch with a diameter that was slightly too large for most women. Now, women wear very large watches. This wasn't the case back then. Fortunately, we sold small watches. But for the diving watch, we had to find a halfway point. And so we picked a smaller diameter. It almost became a normal-sized watch but we were still able to keep the crown and the rotating bezel system. As a daily wear watch, in addition to all of its diving robustness and features such as the bezel for timing, the Bathyscaphe introduced a new element. We thought that the date could potentially be an interesting element and one that wasn't too complicated to incorporate. So we changed the manufacturing process to include this aperture in the dial. The French Navy was the first military to adopt the 50 fathoms. Others soon followed, such as the Germans. They wanted the screwed crown. This had advantages and disadvantages in that the screwed crown is sturdy if you don't open it, but if you leave it opened, it's done for. The Germans believed the five-minute divisions didn't offer a huge advantage. That divers could calculate the length of time they had spent underwater using a triangular mark on the bezel without having engraved numbers. Though not the first of the world's militaries to depend upon the 50 fathoms for their divers, the story of the U.S. Navy's selection of Blancpain is a key chapter in the history of this icon. President Kennedy is seen here with the elite Navy SEAL divers wearing 50 fathoms watches during the early 1960s, but the story begins years before with Blancpain's American distributor, Alan V. Torneck. On a trip to Switzerland to meet with Fichter, Torneck was shown an example of the Blancpain 50 Fathoms. As his son Larry was a diver, Torneck brought the watch back to the U.S. as a gift for Larry. As he flew back across the Atlantic, an idea was hatched. Why not become a supplier to the Navy? What Torneck discovered was that a procurement qualification process had already begun. Plainly drafted after seeing the 50 Fathoms in use by other nations' navies, a 1955 draft specification called for features which Fichter had pioneered. Superior water resistance, light-colored hands against a dark background, and a rotating bezel for timing dives. And one more thing 
a moisture indicator, on the dial. Since these were diving instruments issued for each dive, along with mask, fins, and other equipment, a diver needed to verify that the watch had not been misused by another diver at an earlier time. If he saw that the piece that was given to him showed it wasn't right, he would turn it down and wouldn't run the risk of diving with a compromised piece. Watches from other Swiss companies and from prospective American suppliers were tested between 1957 and 1959. One testing site was the Frankfurt Arsenal, located in Philadelphia. This sprawling facility dated to 1816 and the administration of President James Madison. Only one watch passed all the tests, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms. The clarity of Fichter's vision in his design was confirmed by the American test divers. Quote, the outer ring of the watches soon came to be regarded as an indispensable feature. The ease of setting the ring and of reading the numbers were very clearly superior in the Blancpain watch as compared to other types that were in use at the scene. After what the Navy described as hard use, with shocks, came this final summary of the tests of the Blancpain. In summary, experience with 12 Blancpain underwater watches during Operation Hardtack yielded virtually complete satisfaction. No worthwhile suggestions for improvement of this watch can be offered. This version of the 50 Fathoms, which the American Navy selected, notable with its moisture indicator on the dial, was named by Blancpain the Millspec. Winning the competition to become the U.S. Navy's dive watch still left the maze of government regulations. One such regulation required the purchase of U.S.-made rubies for the movement. America had begun producing a small number of watchmaking rubies for the Army. The quality of those rubies was poor compared to the rubies that already existed and had been perfected for a hundred years in Switzerland. He bought the rubies in America as required by the specification, but actually used the rubies from Switzerland, which allowed us to preserve Swiss chronometry and the watchmaking rubies' production qualities. So, I don't know where they ended up. The original mil-spec was followed by a second version, appropriately enough named the mil-spec 2. The mil-spec 2 incorporated a few changes from the first version. A case made of German silver, the movement with beryllium plates to reduce the magnetic signature of the watch, and a matte finish on the case to reduce the risk of reflections when a diver reached the surface. Blancpain's ties to military around the world were important, but so too were amateur divers. Throughout the three decades that Fichter led Blancpain following the debut of the first model, witnessed the debut of more than a dozen different variants of the 50 and the Bathyscaf. Throughout its history, a number of models have achieved special notoriety. One is the iconic No Radiations version. The symbol on the dial guaranteed the owner that no radioactive compounds had been used for the luminous markings that would glow in darkness. At some point, a panic spread about the radium. All of a sudden, in America, people got worked up because some said, oh, I caught the radiations. I was irradiated by my watch. Noteworthy as well are the versions made by Blancpain but sold under different names. One example is the Aqualung, which was created for the Aqualung dive shops in France 
where the watch was sold alongside the full range of diving equipment. In the U.S., many were sold by Alan Torneck under the name Torneck Rayville. Rayville, a name used by Blancpain for a short period of time, was selected to call to mind Villaret, Blancpain's native village. The Fichter chapter in the Saga of the Fifty Fathoms came to an end in the early 1980s when Fichter stepped down, coincident with the sale of Blancpain to the renowned Swiss watch movement company Frédéric Piguet. That sale was to place the evolution of the Fifty Fathoms on hold, as Blancpain shifted its focus to dress and complicated watches. The 50s slumber was to last two decades. No one could have foretold young people's interest in the diving watch. And as for me, I am very happy to have played a part in this prelude. The two decades following Piguet's purchase of Blancpain witnessed profound changes. First was moving Blancpain's workshops to the Vallée du Joux. Jacques Piguet's family hailed from the Vallée, dating back to its founding in 1860 by famed complicated watchmaker Louis Élysée Piguet. Second, of course, was the installation of new management. To lead the commercial side of the business, Jacques Piguet enlisted Jean-Claude Biver. Following the purchase by Piguet, diving watches disappeared from the collections as the symbol of Blancpain became the moon phase. Finally, in 1999, the name 50 Fathoms re-emerged. Piguet and Biver debuted a series called The Trilogy three watches representing land, sea, and air. Naturally, the sea timepiece of the collection was called 50 Fathoms. Blancpain was to transform itself again. Piguet sold Blancpain together with his movement business, Frédéric Piguet, and in 2001, Mark A. Hayek arrived to take the reins as the new CEO and president. His vision was to elevate and reinvigorate all of the aspects of the House of Blancpain, building a new team of watchmakers and movement engineers, renovating and expanding the Piguet workshops, including an historical building in Le Brassu, dating to 1890, and merging Piguet into Blancpain. His first project, however, was the 50 Fathoms. The 50 Fathom with history was the trilogy at this time. It was the three-dimensional basil uh, with the, the figures on the relief. And the original was, for me, so beautiful. The beauty of it was just stunning. It was timeless. I fell in love with the pieces from the 50s. For me, I think we have to do that. We have to bring this beauty back alive. I just felt that today we can do something that looks much, much closer to the original and has the advantages uh, of today's material. As a passionate diver whose affinity for the undersea world began when he was a small boy and grew throughout his life, Hayek saw a common bond between himself and Jean-Jacques Fichter, his predecessor at Blancpain from two decades prior. Mr. Fichter was a very passionate diver when he created the 50 Fathom. And it was part of you doing something more than just a marketing thing. There's a market and you sell it. I felt the 50 Fathom was at its time contributing because you didn't have a, a dive computer. I mean, that was an absolutely highly important piece of your equipment. Also, 50 Fathom was not even sold in, in watch stores at the beginning. It was exclusive in dive stores uh, as an instrument. So it was pushing the limits what uh, 
you could do on the water, the precision of timing, how far you could go, how long. Uh, so it, it helped actually discover. It, it didn't only help uh, the army, uh, it helped science. It helped discovering the underwater world. Uh, and I thought we have to give something like that today as well back. What debuted was the 2003 anniversary 50 Fathoms. It was a limited series of 150 pieces. Harkening back to the 50s of the Fichter era, the anniversary edition was far from a mere recreation of the past. Its vintage spirit was fortified by thoroughly modern innovations. Its caliber 1150 movement featured two mainspring barrels to achieve a power reserve of more than four days. Its Bombay rotating bezel, dark with luminous white markings, a Fichter idea whose worth had been proven was made of sapphire glass, second only to diamond in hardness and thus scratch resistant. Not only did the launch event for the anniversary 50 debut the watch, it furnished the occasion for Hayek to meet Bob Maloubier as the two teamed up for a dive together in Thailand. Almost immediately, after selling out the limited edition anniversary 50 fathoms, Hayek set Blancpain's watchmakers upon a more ambitious project, a new 50 fathoms with a new high performance movement. We need something that is purely developed with the thought of the 50 fathom. The 50 fathom was done without any compromise in the 50s. The 50 fathom of the 21st century, that is the new 50 fathom. Not only the anniversary, that's the beginning of the new, the real new standard. That's, that's this, that's 2007. And for that, we needed the movement. We had to have a lot of power. So the base was a triple barrel. High power and long power reserve automatically uh, gives you uh, stability, stability on, on the precision. It had to have screw regulation. So it's quite, quite stable and robust on, on shocks. And then the beauty of the movement, you know, you can do a man version with, with the Grand Chateau because you have the tradition that lives there. If you just do a, a bigger movement, say, okay, we have a bit more space. Easy. You know, there's many movements out there. Oh, good. But that was not the goal. It should be as robust, uh, hold up as good as all these movements doing spot, having shocks, but it had to have more beauty and definitely higher performance. Hayek's partner for the official launch of the new 50 Fathoms with its high performance caliber 1315 movement was world champion freediver Gianluca Giannoni. Gianluca is a multiple world record holder in freediving, different categories actually. It's impressive when you see somebody, how far he can go. You see how far we can go actually, if we really have to will to do it. Giannoni received his watch from Hayek underwater during a dive in the south of France. We launched the watch underwater. We have, to, we have to do it a different way. We have to launch our partnership and he has to get his watch under the water and not, not on land. If you tried it once yourself, I think you realize what is happening then. That was a lot of fun with Giannoni. There was even more to Hayek's ambitious revival of the 50 Fathoms as alongside the new movement, he saw a place for complications, including a tourbillon. The 50 Fathom has today different faces. The original has to hold up as today's sport watch dive instrument on the top level. And on the other side, we have the love of just a high-end watchmaker. You know, we have the spirit of Blomba. Let's add Blomba's side. Add the other side that we have in our history, in our know-how, in the love we have for mechanics. Let's add that to 50 uh, Tourbillon, something that's so typical for us and so much Blancpain. And you can dive and you can admire the beauty of a Tourbillon better because it's bigger underwater. And as well, the chronograph, we only put the chronograph the day we had pushes that you use underwater, no matter what depth. So I would never do a complication uh, on a 50 that you cannot go and dive with. As Fichter had done before in 1956, Hayek broadened the 50 Fathoms line with a smaller size alternative bearing the same Batiscaf name. The basil was a bit smaller. The overall watch was smaller, but the opening was bigger, so it was a sporty watch, 
you could use it as a dive watch. It had all the functionalities, it had the waterproofness, but it sacrificed a bit of the readability on the water on the basal. It made it more wearable outside. You also dive maybe, but you love the watch first. And you wear it first as a watch and you can dive with it. And the 50 was a dive instrument and you can also wear it as a watch. In addition to its smaller size and bezel made of ceramic, the modern Bathyscaf, as was the case with the vintage models, was perfect for the addition of useful complications to enhance its everyday wear. We have uh, moon faces in a lot of combinations. It's in a Bathyscaf, uh, where we have a moon face complete calendar. I personally think annual calendar is one of the most useful complications that you can have in our life. With its features and design so widely adopted by the watch world as a whole, it's easy to forget that when Fichter created the original 50 Fathoms, it truly was a watch like no other, a pioneering timepiece. Hayek wanted modern Blancpain to honor that heritage by repeating the feat, create a modern mechanical dive watch of today that would be revolutionary, that would break new ground. This project would be called the X Fathoms. We have to develop something, do something that had, keeps the spirit, that shows you know, mechanical competence, the will to take risk and to push the limits and to go new ways, uh, creation, innovation, but thought for the diving watch. We need to measure the depth, we need to measure the time, and what it is, is not only to measure time, but to measure time as countdown. Because what you do, you do your decompression stop or your safety stop at uh, three or five meters uh, after every dive. Today, dive computer, he does that. But mechanical watch, forget it. At first, the Blancpain team thought that no such watch could ever be done. A new material called liquid metal used for a pressure membrane made the impossible possible. That's possible because you have uh, not only technical components, but new materials. Uh, that would not have been possible 20 or 30 years ago. I think it's really pushing the limit of what you can do today in a mechanical uh, diving watch, 100% mechanical. There's not, nothing else that exists that can do that. The X Fathoms fully fulfilled Hayek's vision. Two depth gauges, one with an expanded scale and the second showing depths to 90 meters. A hand recording the maximum depth during the dive. Unequaled precision, measuring depths to within half a meter. For the five meter decompression stop, a five minute countdown timer. No other mechanical diving watch had ever been built matching these features and performance. For Mark Hayek, the rebirth of the 50 Fathoms was more profound than the creation of new timepieces faithful to its history. He called upon Blancpain to revitalize its connection to the broad ocean community. He named it Blancpain's Ocean Commitment. For me personally, it started uh, with Fichter uh, in, in the 50s because uh, he developed the 50 Fathom not with the thought of developing a watch, but with the need of a dive instrument. And that opened the possibilities for the team from Gusto, for Navy divers, uh, to push the limits, to have more reliable, precise timing possibilities, what is crucial uh, for diving. So for me, that was the first step. But today we talk about ocean commitment, giving back something to ocean, of, of education to the people, of uh, trying to help, trying to motivate people to, to protect the beauty, to preserve it. The Galapagos. With the support of Blancpain, National Geographic Pristine Seas has finished our scientific expedition exploring these magical volcanic islands. We also deployed our submarine to explore down to 450 meters. This is a world that Darwin never saw. We found several undescribed species of fish, including what's possibly a new species of cat shark. The second half of our expedition 
took us hundreds of kilometers northwest from the main islands to the remote outpost of Darwin and Wolf. Our scientific surveys show that the shark biomass here is the highest in the world. While the Galapagos are one of the best preserved places on the planet, they are also under threat. And our surveys have shown that the endemic grouper here is extremely overfished, with nearly a 90% reduction in population size over the past few decades. The Galapagos archipelago is extraordinary and a critically important ecosystem on our planet. Thank you, Blancpain, for helping make this expedition possible so that we can further protect this incredible place. Pristine Seas, we were uh, the founding partner. You know, it's not just research, it's not just showing the beauty and communicating, it's getting the contact to the political, influential people, to the president of countries, to protect their area and giving business models. You know, you can go and, and bring the country and say, guys, don't kill the sharks, that's uh, uh, bad. How can I ask from somebody to not do something if I don't give him an alternative? And how can any president of a country think that it's popular in his country, say, you're not allowed to protect that, where it's a base of food for his people without giving them alternative? We show you what you have. So we show how beautiful it is, how important it is, how it should be protected, and we give you a ready business model, a way that the people will have more and not less by protecting it. And that gave results. And that was fantastic with, with Pristine Seas to be part of it. The Pristine Seas results flowing from the time of Blancpain's partnership were stunning. Of the 14 expeditions supported by Blancpain, 10 resulted in governmental decrees protecting ocean territory, including the Galapagos Marine Reserve. In total, there was a doubling of the surface area of environmentally protected ocean, 4 million square kilometers. Blancpain aligned as well with French diver, scientist, photographer, and environmentalist Laurent Balesta, becoming a founding partner of his Gombesa projects. At the heart of this expedition in South Africa, there is a fish, the celocanth, called Gombesa locally. This fish is mythical. For a long time, people believed it had disappeared 65 million years ago, at about the same time as the dinosaurs. Then, in 1938, it was found again in a fisherman's net in South Africa, and that unleashed the passions of researchers around the world. This fish is unique. It is an animal that carries with it the signs of transformation between life in the ocean and life on land for vertebrates. It has inside of it bone segments, like that for the feet of land animals. It also has inside of it components of skeleton that would be precursors for lung cavities. This fish is extremely rare. It lives at great depths in the interior of grottos that are very difficult to enter. The idea of diving to find the animal was a utopian dream. Inaccessible depth, technological difficulties, no sense of the exact place where it lived. I waited 10 years to get ready until I felt my team could try this dive. We had an enormous privilege and joy which is hard to describe to become the first to capture the celocanth in photos. It was an unforgettable moment. Ballesta's celocanth study was a scientific triumph, helping to understand the size of the population and how to best protect it. It was also a milestone for scuba diving itself. His film of the celocanth has fascinated the millions who have seen it and underscored the importance of ocean preservation. In addition to supporting the celocanth expeditions, 
Blancpain has continued to support Balesta's follow-on Gombesa expeditions elsewhere in the world. As a diver in, in passion for underwater exploration, uh, I had a lot of dream. And so I, I have to find a partner able to, to make my dream come true. And I find this partner with Blancpain. That was really the brand really able to help me, to support me on a long-term vision. Blancpain has extended an invitation for watch collectors to join with it in actively supporting its ocean commitment with special limited edition timepieces for which donations are made. Ocean commitment, as it became an overall project and, and our and a multitude of projects, an overall name, uh, an institution, uh, we felt we have to do uh, a limited series uh, to honor it on one side, um, to, and to get and permit our clients and passionate people to actively participate. Yeah, we get 250 pieces, that's 1,000 euros per piece that we put on donation, so it's financing um, additional expeditions. For example, Loro did uh, a second expedition. The Combessa uh, with the sharks, Combessa 3, uh, became possible through that. You, you really get an additional value uh, linked to the ocean with each uh, of this limited series. As the world has come to understand what the 50 Fathoms has meant for both diving watches and diving itself, collectors have come to covet the vintage pieces. Vampaz created a special vintage department in Le Brassu for service and restoration. We've seen the last 18, 20 years a very, very strong pickup in the collector market. You see it by the prices. I remember when I started looking for 50 Fathoms, the nice pieces were between two, two and a half thousand euros and five thousand dollars. Six, very special. Today, uh, yeah, I just spent over 100,000 to get one uh, that uh, we needed, didn't have yet, uh, so prices exploded. And with that, more of them come naturally to be serviced. So we had to build up uh, a stronger vintage department. These watches have to live forever. So you have to be able to, to service them. You have to be able to restore it and bring them back alive. The history is repeating itself a little bit. Because <laughs> the 50 Fathom made for, was, was a big success for Blomba, made Blomba for, for quite a, a, a period of time, for several decades. And uh, we see today again uh, the, the, the progress is here, the, the success is here uh, of, the, of the line. And at the same time, it's, it's more than just a watch. You know, it, was, it didn't start as a watch, it started as a dive instrument. It is today again more than a, just a watch. Uh, not only the dive instrument, with the ocean commitment, you know bringing the ocean as, as, uh, as a bigger theme, you know, uh, going beyond uh, just the instrument or just the watch. And uh, I'm very happy that this is repeating itself uh, like it was in the 50s. And uh, as long as it might continue and work, as long as I'm here, I will continue to, to push it and develop it and cherish it. Peace. 